In this video, we talk about categorical perception, which is one of the fundamental concepts you want to be familiar with in speech perception. The main idea is that perception reflects category membership rather than continuous physical differences. We'll get into what this means acoustically, but I thought I'd describe this first by using an analogy with a map of Minnesota and Wisconsin. Suppose Jen lives in the Twin Cities, and her friend Tara lives up in Duluth. Both of them drive around in cars with Minnesota license plates. Jim lives in Eau Claire, which is just across the border, so even though he lives very close to Jen, his license plate looks very different. And so, obviously, the difference here is that boundary line between the two states. Ruth lives pretty far from Jim, but even she has a Wisconsin license plate, so the similarities or differences between license plates represent the state you're in rather than the actual difference between the two people. Otherwise, Jen and Jim would have very similar license plates. When we think about perception, we think not in terms of, you know, license plates or memberships, we think about how we'd label different things that we're perceiving. So for example, if you see all these dots on the screen, you'd say that they're all blue, right? These are all just different shades of blue, and if we had continuous perception, we can order them in terms of light to dark. But if we were perceiving categorically, we would just say that these are all blue. These are all the same, and this one is different because it's green. So categorically, all the things on the left would be indiscriminable, but the thing on the right, the green one, would be the only one that's different. A classic example of categorical perception in speech is perception of voice onset time. Here, from the top to the bottom, we have a continuum between deer and tear. We would classify the beginnings of these sounds as beginning with either D or T, but not something in between D or T. So we would draw a category line above which everything is D and below which everything is T. To demonstrate that we're perceiving things categorically, we have to do two things. We have to run an identification test and a discrimination test. In an identification test, you hear one sound and you're asked, was it this one or that one? In this case, was this a ba or was it a pa? Then you get another sound. Is this one a ba? Is this one a pa? And behind the scenes, what we're doing with the sounds is continuously varying them. So for example, changing the voice onset time to vary in five millisecond increments. And every time I play one for you, let's say I play one with zero milliseconds voice onset time, 0% of the time you call it pa, because that's a voice onset time way too short. You're going to call that ba every time. And I've if I play for you a very long voice onset time, then almost every time you're going to call it a pa. So if we perceived continuous differences between this range of voice onset times, our response function would look like this. As we slightly change the VOT, our perception should also slightly change. But this turns out to not really be how it shows up in our results. When we play the zero millisecond voice onset time, yeah, we get 0% pa responses, and at the other end we get the opposite. But starting from the left, if we play the 5 millisecond VOT, we still get 0%. 10 milliseconds VOT, we still get 0%. 15, 20, we're never calling it a P sound. And then suddenly, at 25, our perception jumps way up to 100% PA, and it stays up there for the whole rest of the continuum. So drawing this function, it looks more like a staircase rather than that straight diagonal line. So what we would say is that our category boundary lies somewhere between 20 and 25 milliseconds. This was the first half. We also have to run a discrimination experiment. In this kind of experiment, you get two sounds and you're just asked, were those two sounds the same or were they different? And here's how we plot those results. Suppose I play for you two sounds, one was zero and one was five milliseconds VOT. And you're asked, was this the same or was it different? Now, if you have super, super accurate hearing, you can tell them apart 100% of the time. But that's not really how it works. You might guess that we tell them apart 0% of the time, but that's also not true. Because we really are just guessing. If we can't tell them apart, our percentage correct discrimination would hover right around 50%. And we get the same answer if we compare 5 to 10, around 50% correct. Same for thing for the next step and the next one. But then once we compare 20 and 25 milliseconds VOT, our performance goes way up to about 100%. So we think, okay, maybe we just need a longer VOT to tell the two different steps apart. 
But that's not really accurate either, because as soon as we go beyond this time point, it jumps back down to 50%, and it remains there for the rest of the continuum. So the function has just a single peak, and where that peak occurs, we again say, is the category boundary. If we superimpose those two lines, we can see that the category boundary is consistent with both of them. It's where the identification function crosses over, and it's where the discrimination function has a peak. Left of that boundary, everything is a B, and to the right of the boundary, everything is a P, and our category boundary is somewhere around 23 or 22 milliseconds. Now, it's important to contrast this against what we'd call continuous perception, where we would assign things a gradient perception that's continuously changing without any discrete jumps. That would be continuous, but instead, it looks like perception is more like categorical. It just jumps immediately from one to the next. So our signatures of categorical perception are as follows. A steeply sloping identification function rather than a diagonal line, and a peak in the discrimination function that occurs exactly at the crossover point of that identification slope. VOT is not the only speech cue that is perceived categorically. For example, if we have a continuum between sha and sa, it would sound like this. Sha, 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 sha. And at some point along that continuum, you probably changed from hearing a sha to hearing a sa in a very discrete jump. We can also change between hearing da to ba. Da, 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 ba, ba, ba. Again, your perception probably took a discrete jump somewhere in the middle of that continuum. And finally, we can go from hearing cha to sha. Cha, 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 cha. Categorical perception is a very important concept to know in speech perception, but as it turns out, it's not a really full description of how we perceive things. It's an anchor, it's a major idea that was popularized in the late late 60s, early 70s, but it's been shown numerous times to not really describe all the different things we can do perceptually. So for example, we really are sensitive to within category differences, which help us identify differences between talkers, predict upcoming words, and tune to systematic changes in speech. Also, we might have gotten those results because the way that we test might have suffered from limitations in, in these methods. For example, if I only give you two options, ba and pa, of course I'm not giving you an option to, res to respond with something in between, or say, this was about 15% of a ba and 85% of a pa. If I don't give you those options, then of course I'll never know if that's what your perception was. So to close this out, categorical perception is an important idea to know, but isn't a fully accurate description of how per speech perception works. Another thing that we want to think about that ties in with categorical perception is the idea that there are multiple acoustic cues present in the signal at any point in time. So for example, when we talked about VOT, that's one of the differences we use to hear voicing, but there are lots of them. Let's take, for example, the word on the left, loss, and the word on the right, laws. There are a lot of acoustic differences between these. Obviously, on the left we'll have lack of low frequency energy, and on the right we'll have that low frequency energy which is the indication of voicing during the z sound. But also, on the left our first formant remains at a higher frequency, whereas on the right the first formant has a little bit of a downslope to it. On the left, in loss, the vowel is shorter than it is in laws. The fricative in loss is longer than the fricative in laws. And you can express those two differences in terms of a ratio, even if you don't want to um, measure them as separate entities. The L has a slightly different duration in both of these words, and also has a slightly different F2 onset frequency in both of these words. Up top on the waveform, we can also see that the envelope structure is different in both of these words. So as you can tell, Whenever we're perceiving anything, we're perceiving a whole constellation of acoustic cues, any one of which might take priority over the others.